already started, the interaction has already begun. Um, and I made uh, two pieces of toast and a hot chocolate, and I can remember putting the hot chocolate into the cup, boiling the kettle. I have no memory of pouring, at that time, the hot water into the hot chocolate. I do remember eating the toast, so it was midnight. The very next thing I can remember is I put my cup under the tap, washed it, put it onto the sideboard, and thought, that's odd, I, I don't normally do that. Oh, I should go to bed now. Turn around, 1.30. And I thought, that's not right, I haven't been here an hour and a half. And I sat down and I thought, this is something very wrong here. So I went into the sitting room and thought, I must try and understand what's happened. And within about 10 to 15, sec 10 to 15 minutes, part of a memory came back. So that was, that's a classic example of missing time. Objects out of place. I haven't seen this, this is my own personal thing. Um, I'll give you an example of objects out of place. Uh, less than two weeks ago, uh, I was going to put stuff up in the loft. And uh, I needed to get the ladder ready. So uh, I, I love tea, <laughs> made another cup of tea, and then had my tea and then took the ladder to get up to the loft. And the next thing I know, I'm two landings up. Where's my tea? Oh, I don't know. Down. Where's my ladder? Why was my ladder on a different landing? Why was my teacup somewhere else? But there was no missing time, but it was objects out of place. So sometimes it isn't the time that alerts you to something's happened, it's what you were doing is wrong. So you might find yourself in a different room. But when when, when uh, an, an abductee or a contactee says, well, I was taken and I was dropped back in the garden, um, that's somebody trying to hold up the program. So that's not missing time as such. When people get put back in the wrong clothes or, or the wrong room from an abduction, that is because generally the greys are trying to sabotage the program. I'm just talking about when you have a straightforward interaction and one minute you were holding a kitchen utensil and then the next minute you've got you know, the jack for the motor car and you can't work it out. So there's a difference between missing time and objects. Okay, there are three questions that the press corps are forbidden to ask the President of the United States at the weekly White House briefing, unless specifically authorized. One's Cuba, but there's an asterisk there. You're not allowed till recently to ask the President any question about Cuba, unless the press corps have been told prior to that. You're not allowed to ask about the National Security Agency of America, and you are not allowed to ask about UFOs or aliens. If any member of the press corps asks any of those questions, that press organization is banned for three to six months from coming back to the White House. Um, just at the end of last year, uh, there was a lot of kickoff regarding um, the eavesdropping of the NSA on world leaders, and Obama said he would have a one hour press conference on the NSA which members of the press could come and ask questions. Do you know not one member of the press asked a single question about the NSA? They asked everything but. And that just shows you how controlled they are. Right, when I do interviews uh, for the American media, they always want to know what do I think about Dr. Stephen Greer. It's so predictable. When I do something for the British, Instead of asking insightful questions, they always want to know what do I think about David Icke. And the big question is, why are you? You know, why are you? Are you special? And you're thinking, you know, you're so backward, you're so primitive, you are so unawake, you're asking these sort of questions of me. What a waste of time. If you've got 15 minutes to interview somebody, try and interview them and get something interesting. Don't do, you know, fuel your own wars. It's a prisonable offense in America to fraternize with an alien. Although, of course, aliens don't exist. Okay, uh, somebody mentioned Palladian. Right? I'm a Palladian. Everybody wants to be a Palladian. Nobody wants to be a reptilian. Okay? Um, we talked about a little bit about humans and souls. Uh, it's a prisonable offence in America to swim, fraternise, or touch a dolphin 
unless it's within state or federal approved oceanic center. Now when you question that, they say, oh, it's about preserving them, protecting them. So yeah, but you can go and buy a 12 ball gun in America and go and shoot a moose. You don't do it for turtles. So the people in power know the very, very special nature of dolphins. Very special nature. Okay, moving on. You haven't, haven't had a single story about me yet. I hope your organizers will be happy. Right, shush, everyone, listen to me. I have something important to tell you. A UFO has crashed in the school playground. We are waiting for the police to tell us it's safe to go outside and take a look. When I came to visit you in October, we talked a little bit about this. That produced a flood of photos for me. Parents phoning me up, um, sending me emails, sending me pictures of school kids that they had surreptitiously taken throughout the land, and I'm going to share some of those with you. Uh, I used this picture, you may remember. Um, remember, UFOs don't exist, but the government pays schools to run dummy UFO crashes. And this is a school, and that's not an actor. They have a budget, they actually pay for police officers, they pay for the fire brigade and the ambulance to attend. This is why they need the money, because it's these people's time. So the police put a cordon around, and uh, an actor, part of the companies who do these, dresses up in an NBC suit, nuclear biological suit, and pretends to look at the UFO crash. This is a school playground and then he takes samples of the crashed UFO. I have blocked out their faces because it is illegal to show anybody under, the 18, under 18 their faces, so I've done that. But I wanted to show you, this is exactly what's going on in schools throughout England. In fact, in Wales as well. So here we are, there's genuine police officers, there's the cordon, the UFO crash is here, and the kids are all getting conditioned to understand and be ready for a UFO crash. Here's another one in another part of the country. Uh, a very tiny little thing there, but again the cordon. Here's another one with fires. They've actually set fires, and this thing is supposed to have come into the ground and caused a great rift. They had the school kids coming out with their teacher, their class teacher. Here's another one. And then you can dress up and be a scientist and put on the, the suits and come and investigate the alien material. Here's another one, where it's a big crash site. And we talked about why. If UFOs and aliens don't exist, why would the system try and educate children? And it must be they're getting them ready for a false flag alien invasion. Getting them ready. These kids are five, six, seven, and eight. By the time they're 15, 16, 17, they'll be expecting it. Oh yeah, we did that in school. And the difference is that if it's a real UFO crash, you won't be allowed within a mile of it. But if the tape goes around it, and you can all hold hands, and come and have a look at this, that's not real. And that's what they're being got ready for. This is uh, interesting, somebody did a little hard work for me. This is a nursery school, and it's a rug. When I was at school, you had to sit on chairs. <laughs> but now, thank goodness, it's easier. So three, four, five-year-olds sit on the rug with their class teacher and do whatever they have to do. And this is a rug. And a person I know very well spotted this rug and said, there's an alien on that rug. Ooh. And said to the teacher, oh, when you get rid of that rug, can I have it? No, you can't have it. So anyway, they went back the next day, oh, no, that's not true, went back the next week, and the rug was getting ready to be thrown out. And this person very, very carefully took some pictures with their camera, because they're not allowed to do that. You can see the earth, and a series of children around the outside. If you look, I'm going to use the laser pointer. Here is a blue tub. This has been very strategically pressed against the other side to hide the alien. So my friend, took a risk, lifted the edge, and took a picture for me, which is brilliant. That's its head. But if you look at the blue can, it's been used to push against it to hide it. So uh, I was able to get the stock number for this. I phoned the company that made it and said, you know, I'd like one of those rugs. Um, because of who I am, that's not a problem. Fine. Uh, I said, well, could you just send me a picture of it? 
He said, well, you, won't, you don't need that. You've got the stock number. I said, yeah, I know, but I'll have the picture. Sent it to me, and it wasn't the right one. They'd replaced the alien with an Eskimo. And I said, actually, I want the other one. And the woman said, oh, you mean the alien? I said, yeah. She said, oh, it's a limited edition. We're not doing them now. We haven't got them. But at least we've got the pictures. So again, if aliens don't exist, why are three, four, and five-year-olds being taught about... Wait for it. It's called inclusion. They actually say it's inclusion. But why would you include something that doesn't exist? So when you look at them at three, four, and five, sitting on a rug, and then at a later age range, looking at UFO crashes, you begin to see a discerning pattern here. Okay. Often I'm asked, where is the proof? Well, the proof is out there. It really is out there. Now, I'm not going to make any apologies for showing you that. Because that is one of the greatest proofs. Whether you think it's a psyops or not, the fact of the matter is that somebody has got UFOs. We all know, but maybe you don't know, that Colonel Du Bois was actually Ramey's adjutant. And if you look at his face, I like this one, because if you look at Colonel Du Bois's face, you couldn't have a more guilty face. You're all familiar with this, I'm not going to time you are. I'm sure familiar with the telegram. Hands up. Not all of you. Okay. Roger Ramey got a telegram in his hand and in 1947. Who would have thought that the software would come around that could read what was on that telegram? You wouldn't have imagined it. So Ramey's sitting there with a telegram in his hand looking through loads of rubbish, pretending it's just rubbish, which it is, and he has a telegram, and of course stick it through a, a software reader and you get the truth. Uh, again, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. It basically says that they identify a disc craft which has crashed just west of the cordon, and it two things it calls them, the aviators and the um, aviators of the disc, they are where they will go for, and the victims of the wreck. So here you have absolute proof that something happened. And a good friend of mine, um, a member of the military, was able to get hold of the um, lists for the flights in and out of uh, a number of bases. And there certainly was a lot of wreckage that was flown out over a two-day period. But people don't go and look anymore. They don't want to educate themselves. They're very happy in their own world. There is the proof. It is out there. So if aliens are real, the authorities could never cover it up this long. That's another question. How could you hide it? He did what he did for 50 years. And the establishment knew what he was doing. And they covered it up. So if they could cover up him for 50 years, then goodness me, they could cover up the fact of something much, much bigger, uh, although not to those people and the families concerned, but from a global perspective, uh, aliens coming here. So yes, they have a very clever means of, of keeping lids on things. Very quickly, want to widen this out now. Who was Wallace? Who could tell me who Wallace was? Who was Wallace to do with Charles Darwin? That's just brilliant, isn't it? Right, Charles Darwin's father was a 32nd degree mason. The evolution of the species was an Illuminate program, dog eat dog, only the strong survive. So Darwin came from an incredibly wealthy background, very powerful, his dad was a 32nd degree mason. Wallace worked with Darwin. Wallace actually helped him to come up with the theory of the evolution of species, but the point was that Wallace said, Evolution of species works really well for everything except people. Can't work with people. It's impossible. It just doesn't work. But Darwin, of course, his father was a very powerful man. So Wallace, you haven't even heard of him. He's jointly co-authored those books and was pushed out because it didn't suit the agenda. So the evolution of species is all about how the fittest survive, which is a very reptilian trait, is a very Illuminati trait. Um, I've altered this because it's not quite right, but then I worked at the Natural History Museum, so I would alter it. Uh, it's talking about the missing link. 
We all joke about the missing link, but very few of us actually understand what it means. It means that there's absolutely no fossil record to show real humans evolving from a more ape-like creature. But we're told that's what happened. So the arrow here is actually not right. It's about 200,000 years ago. At 200,000 years ago, there was a big change when modern humans evolved from less modern humans. And what this interesting um, one website was showing was how could you go from a very, very primitive uh, humanoid form to a very advanced humanoid form when something should take many, many millions of years, not just the odd three or four. Uh, on the left is a human, and on the right is a fossil called Lucy. It's about two to three million years old. In order to sell the idea that apes are humans and that we can trace humanity back in this form, I'll show you what they do. Can I move here? Shoulder blade. You know that monkeys have really long arms that go right past their knee. So what these people do is they artificially lift these bones up too high so that the fingers come up above the knee and they'll pass it off as a human. That's human, that's where your shoulders should be. They artificially lift them up because they haven't got human fossils, really, at the number they say they have. And they say, well, this is a, a cross between a human and an ape and it shows how it's evolving. But when you actually look at it from an anatomical point of view, there's no way it's human. But they have to pad out the lie. 1.8 million years and about 1.8 million years. That's a, the best rendition of the faces of creatures that lived on this planet. That's the best you're going to get at the moment. How did it go from that? 1.8 million, 1.8 million to that. Now, this gentleman, if you put him in a suit and a trilby hat, popped him down to the local supermarket, he'd probably get away with it. The other two wouldn't, yet within a few hundred thousand years, impossible from an evolutionary point of view, this came about. What caused the revolution? That's what we call a pebble tool. That's what we call a hand axe. If you're interested, I brought some for you. These are genuine. This is made about 1.7 million years ago. It's from Africa. And this is made 1.6 million years ago. How did it go from that to that in 100,000 years? It's not technically possible. But it is possible if someone is mucking around with your genetic material and changing and altering you. That's how it's possible. Okay, here we go. My turn. The shadow beings, sometimes called the shadow people. Uh, anybody seen what we would call shadow beings? Who's going to be brave and put their hands up? All right. Maybe you've seen them and you don't want to put your hands up. I fully understand that. They're not very pleasant creatures. On the wiki encyclopedia, I'm sorry it's not so good. Um, when I did this, I had no intention of doing a, a talk about it. I just printed this for my own sake. On the right-hand side is a guy, and on the left is somebody's rendition of what they thought they saw. Here's a better one. On the left is called the hat man, on the right is the hooded figure. These are shadow people. Now I'm going to show you the drawing that I did about four years ago when I was a child. Take a very close look at that. I, when I was five, six years old, I just called him the smoke man. It wasn't a shadow being, it was a smoke man. He was a smoke man because he appeared to have the smoke come off him. Um, that's me on the left-hand side as a little boy. And uh, I was taught when I saw it, I would signal. So arms out. It's not very good, it can't put its arms out, it puts them up an angle. That means I'm alone, you can come in. Comes through the window, stands in front of me, raises its arm up, I raise my arm up. What this doesn't show is that an energetic charge runs across from one of its hands to the other. It then throws that energetic charge to me. And what that means is a DNA lock. It means that nobody else can interact with me because he has that DNA code. So if anybody else tries to hack in, or to interrupt, 
uh, that lock is a DNA code, so it can't actually get in. No one else can get in without that. It's a very, very clever device. Um, the creature has like lumps on its head and just eyes. I can have no memory of a nose or a mouth at all. Um, not substantial, but energetic and black, very dark. The reason it's black and dark, I was chatting to a good friend of mine, we were talking about this, is that when you come from the fourth dimension and you don't quite come into the third, it's a bit like a black hole, light. So light doesn't detect this, so that's why it shows really black, because it's not quite come through to the third dimension. Okay, so that's a shadow being. Many, many people have very difficult times with these, these beings. Uh, they can torment and really hurt people. Here we go, the Jinn and the Valon. Uh, here's something taken from uh, the East, and it's a religious man on his prayer, prayer mat, and that is their representation of a Jinn. And here is the Jinn is trying to tempt the religious man. Okay. I want to talk um, about uh, a year ago, I went down to, to the beach, I have a beach hut. And uh, I remember with my wife, we were both standing there, and she said, oh, those birds, look at those birds. This is about 7.30 at night. And looking on the railings, looking down at the sea, where the sea was coming in on the rocks, and from the corner of my eye, I would see what looked like a bat. And then nothing here. And then this side. So it's not a bat because you know the human eye has cones in the center of the eye and rods at the edge. The rods detect black and white, the cones detect color. So uh, what you will see in the peripheral vision is something, but when you look at it, because it's natural, isn't it? You look at it, it's gone. Because you've got to try and follow it from the side. So um, those with Jim, uh, I come from a, from, if you remember my first talk with you, I come from what we would call a a non-satanic Illuminati magical family, and Jin will be around me all the time. Uh, during Skype sessions, people will say, "What the, is that going across your room?" So oh, it's all right. It's Jin. Don't worry about it. Drawing uh, somebody who now works for one of the Rothschilds in Eastern Europe uh, very kindly did me a Jin that she sees regularly. It's around her, and uh, it needs to be black couldn't get colour in, but you can imagine that sort of a very dark grey. That big, that's when it's in its energetic stage. And we're not doing the Illuminati talk, but if you think about um, Peter Pan and Tinkerbell, if you've read any of that, Tinkerbell is a gin. Alright, 1971, very quickly, this is on YouTube, so I'm not going to go over it too much. Uh, 1971, I was 11 and three quarters years of age and I had my two-day experience with a UFO. There it is, it's a teardrop, uh, silver, no windows, no sound, and I can remember the sunlight reflecting off the beautiful silver of this surface. And it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, absolutely beautiful. And I wasn't on my own, there were five kids with me. And this is the deal. Um, again, I'm not going to belabor the point because it's on YouTube and I'm sure you've all seen it. And he says to me, would you like to be like us, to have knowledge and understanding, to know the past, I beg your pardon, to see the future and know the past, to have power and, and I'm so fascinated about knowing the past and the future that I shout out, I should use my mind, but I didn't because I was so excited. So instead of, you know, using my mind, I use my voice, say yes. And he immediately says, then come with me. And his hand drops off my shoulder, takes my hand and leads me away. That's what researchers call a soul agreement. And I'm privileged to be allowed to remember that soul agreement. Uh, it's very important because you can use your soul agreement to escape them if you wish. That's why so many abductees do not remember their soul agreement. Because if they remembered their soul agreement and they've, and they've been tortured and hurt, of course they would want out. So to me it was the bargain. I was 12, that was my bargain, fine. And that is what researchers refer to as a mantid. Uh, to me, it was mum. Mum. When I was perhaps two and a half, three years old, I referred to it as mother. And I was very, very confused because how did I have two mothers? I had this one which said, I'm your mother. And I had my human mother. And so my 
biological mother said to me, the very, very first word I said was daddy. And for six months I called my biological mother daddy. Well, of course, she wasn't my mother because that was my mother. And I realized as you get older, you can't do that um, because it's, it causes aggravation and upset. So I learned to play the human game. This is a, a, a mothership, for want of a better word. I use that word because that's what humans would call it. This is a mantid craft which uh, is looking into human timelines. When you are born and when you die, you have a timeline. You exist. Let's just talk about this one reality. You have one timeline. If you want to be uh, contacted or abducted, then it isn't just chance. This is project management on the nth degree. So they will come for you at two seconds past two o'clock. Uh, and they will spend 30 seconds with you or 50 seconds and it has to be all project managed out. The guys on the front here, they're actually flying the craft. Uh, there are no poles holding the seats up. They are meant to be floating in the air. That's exactly what they're doing. These are viewing screens and they are square. It's about one of the few square or oblong things you'll find on an alien craft. Most things are round or curved, but their viewing screens tend to be oblong or square. So they're flying it. These ones here are coordinating the information which is coming from the lower deck. We'll have a look at the lower deck in a moment. What I've tried to do is to draw the craft to show you how the power, the whole ship acts as a lifting body. It doesn't work like an aeroplane. The whole craft, some people refer to it as alive. Uh, that's not quite accurate, but it has to be the shape to conduct the energy around the hull of the craft. Uh, this is the commander of the craft, and I've done this incorrectly. He should have his right hand on this creature's uh, other shoulder. You see, I've put it on this shoulder here. That's not correct. It should be on that shoulder. Why does that matter? Because mantids are chipped. They have a chip on their left shoulder so they can interact with humans. Uh, if you have a chance to talk to people who seriously are in-depth with their um, investigations, they will know that humans will often place a hand on a, a Nordic or a mantid shoulder because that allows the communication. Uh, right, let's carry on. I get accused of giving out too much information. I get accused of taking everyone along too fast, but I'm not going to dumb you down. Well, that's not what it's about. This is the lower level. Um, what you've got here is uh, these guys who are sitting, operating everything below this line. The standing guys here are operating everything above here. These two are semi sort of coordinators, is the commander come down. So what these guys are doing is sending the information up to the top. So uh, the twofold operation would be to identify where you're going to go to abduct people or contact people and also to eavesdrop on every human communication available. Um, and also uh, enemy aliens. Because if you're interested in a certain human, you bet you someone else is as well, whether it's the NSA or the CIA, uh, and you want to get there first. So it, it, I, when I say it's a game, I don't mean to belittle it, but it is very much like a game of chess. Okay, um, yes, I, I go on the operating table. Uh, I've given permission for that. It has to be done. Uh, I'm not dead. Um, I've been told that as long as stuff goes on, they'll kind of keep my body healthy. Uh, this is an interesting tool. It's a handheld tool, and I haven't been told, but I, I guess that's DNA. It's some energetic DNA take. This is an interesting device here. It looks like a camera. It's not a camera. It's some, something that comes down on a cord or a rope or something from a standing pole. Mantids often um, use equipment that's either handheld or is fixed in the ceiling. And I've got a very interesting drawing from somebody else to show you. Uh, that's me on the left, uh, having DNA extracted. And this is a doctor mounted holding up a jar with a baby in, I presume saying, we've made this from your DNA. It's fine. That's the deal. This is from the collection of David Chase. This is somebody else who's um, come in, and then David Chase has done some drawings. And it, it really accounts well with my own experiences, because here uh, the tool is fixed in the ceiling and is coming down. 
Um, mantids are three, three is called mantid, it's three. This is a doctor mantid, and if you ever get taken ill, that's what you want. You don't want a grey poking you about, you want a mantid. So the doctor mantids are the lowest rung. The next rung of command are the computer operators or the pilots of the craft. Then you go into the officer class, these are the ones that wear the purple robes, and they take the term master. Now the, the, the next rung up is called the universal master. I know we don't live in a universe, we live in a multiverse, but each multiverse has its own verse, so each verse has its own master. Okay, that's how they work it. 1967, we're going to move forward. I forgot to bring my meteorite, I'm really sorry, I should have done. Uh, young boy, sitting room, don't know where my biological mother is, it's probably 7 o'clock in the evening, and I see something fall about 50, 60 feet away. Uh, and it didn't fall diagonally, it fell straight down as if you were dropping a stone. I thought, oh, what's that? So Saturday, so Sunday, uh, I went out and uh, picked it up and it was a meteorite. I took it to the museum and it's been classified as a stony iron. Okay, well, when that meteorite fell, I had a visit. And this is a, a being that visited me. That is a costume it's wearing. Please don't think that that is natural. That is a costume that it has on. It, for the few times I've got a name, its name is Zuga. Zuga. However, it defected and joined the reptile faction. And when it joined the reptile faction, they said, you can't have a name Zuga. We're going to give you a reptile sounding name. So her name was Zuga Lachlama, which is roughly how a reptile, if we transfer it into English, would say. So she is a self-confessed servant of the reptiles. And this creature came into the front room and sat me or stood me up onto the coffee table. I had a coffee table. Mother had a coffee table about that high and said, look at the ceiling. I looked at the ceiling and it just went black and all the stars appeared. Now, she was going into my mind. This is, this is what's known as mind projection. And she was saying, well, this is where we come from and started pointing out the stars to me. And then we did something else which was very interesting. We just give her a little shake because she's a very sexy creature. And, and I thought I'd been taken to a museum. Now, you wouldn't get the sign would you, in real life, saying museum closed? Just wouldn't happen. But it's setting the picture for a, a young boy to know, oh, you're in a museum. And uh, we have here a, a T-Rex, and then she lifts me up. Now, I reckon I'm on the coffee table still. She just picks me up by the waist and just lifts me up. So I have a physical movement to go with the mental projection. Um, and time and time again, I reach out, and I do this several times, and I touch the tooth of the reptile, and uh, they will say this quite often, uh, look at you, the bridge between two worlds. So I'm often referred to as the bridge between two worlds because the reptilian world and another world. And then um, I go around and I know all my dinosaurs, and then a grey comes to collect me. So the point of showing you this is that this is not an experience where I've been taken away, but where I've just been in the front room and the creature has come in and just gone straight into my mind. Okay? I couldn't resist putting this in. That's my white cat, Snustrana. He's a Norwegian forest cat. Um, in 1971, when I had that experience, um, I was shown fossils in a cliff. Uh, prior to that, the day before that, I was collecting coins, stamps, and matchbox tops. After my experience in 1971, I just gave all that up and collected fossils because I'd had an experience where I'd been shown fossil dinosaurs. So from 1971 to this day, I collect fossils. That's why I was in the Natural History Museum. So that is a, it's a, a dinosaur jaw, and my white cat likes to sit with the dinosaur jaw. So I couldn't resist that. Uh, you may remember this. This is a, a genuine badge worn by black ops and military and was given to me uh, because it's a white snake with red eyes and for those of you who haven't seen the YouTube videos we'll come back to him so it's the 73rd experimental air control squadron that means we fly UFOs but we can't put that on the badges in case you you get old of it like I did experimental air squadron but he's white and he has red eyes and he has a sword all right, this is fairly uh, um, well known, but it's very important. It's my life and it's important to me. 
Uh, on the left-hand side, that's before I had uh, initiation into a Draconis reptilian culture. And on the right-hand side, probably six months later, no longer this happy, smiling, uh, carefree boy, but somebody who um, sees a lot, knows a lot, and has been completely changed. Not hurt, but just changed. Very lucky to have these pictures. Famous one for me now, it's becoming famous, gone around the world. 1965, um, I was asked would I be a page boy uh, for uh, uh, friends that my mother worked with, choose my words carefully there, um, and I initially said no, and they just couldn't understand how a five-year-old boy could dictate to his mother what, what he was doing and what he wasn't doing. So anyway, I did agree to it simply because uh, I understood that being a page boy was a very important point. You had a, a ritual. And those of you who know anything about reptiles know that ritual and ceremony are extremely important. Uh, but when you are taking part in a reptilian ceremony, you do not smile. Because they don't smile. They can't smile. They have no need for smile. They don't have emotions. So that's why I am straight-faced. And it was really embarrassing. Those are the two um, uh, bridesmaids behind. And it was like, God, can't you get him to smile? And my mother, biological mother, said, well, if he doesn't want to smile, he doesn't want to smile. I can't make him. That is why I look like that, because that's the way you have to be when you're in a ceremony. Obviously, as I got older, then... Um, there's a good point here. Uh, prize for being a good page boy, the family sent us to Butlins for the week. And our mother came up and said, take a picture of you in Butlins, and asked me to smile. Now, a researcher said, oh, you poor traumatized boy. But no, that's not traumatized. That's how reptiles, that's a reptilian. Any, anybody here who's reptilian and don't want to admit it, or you have reptilian DNA, or you have a soul, you'll know what that is. That's, that's the way you show interest. Right, OK, I think it's probably time for a tea break. Uh, there will be questions afterwards if anybody wants to ask any. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, have a nice cup of tea. Please don't be too long, because I need to crack on. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, interesting break. Uh, very uh, nice to talk to some of you. Uh, one particular uh, person came up to me and uh, had experienced some of those creatures. Um, if she pops up afterwards, just write her an email address down. Maybe I can be of assistance. But what that's brought me out to say is that for everybody who stands here in front of you and says, I've had an okay relationship with aliens, there will be five, six hundred who have not had an okay relationship with aliens. My story is a very different. Um, a book that's worth trying to get hold of is by Dr. Carla Turner, Into the Fringe. Um, I think she's just about got it right. So. Uh, whilst I am telling you that my situation is okay, that is not representative of the general situation. It's one thing to stand here and tell you how good it is. It's a totally different kettle of fish to say how bad it is. So people will find it very hard to stand in front of an audience and tell you how they've been abused. So it becomes skewed. You get stories of people who have okay times and it begins to skew your perception. The perception is that most beings from the fourth dimension are negative to humanity. Okay. We need to speed up. <clears throat> I introduced you to the being I call mum. Let me introduce you to the being I call dad. Why do I call them that? Because that's what they wanted me to call them. You remember the badge or um, emblem I showed you of the white snake and the red eyes, which were given to me by a member of the American Special Forces? Uh, I've brought it tonight if anybody wants to have a look at that original badge. And this is a Draconis reptilian. Now, I am only aware of three types of reptilian. There are several but I'm aware of three sorts. This is the royal line, Draconis. Those spines on its back are actually residual wings. Uh, it can't fly with them. Uses it to signal during ritual and ceremony. It can actually rustle them. It sounds like an old chamois leather 
or old dry leaves rustling. So it's a, it's a physical signal. So that's the creature I refer to as dad. Um, this took about six months to, to draw. Uh, a very helpful guy uh, in America, uh, an artist, a uh, reconstruction artist, would send me a drawing, an email. I would say, no, you've got the hands wrong, send it back. And this went back and forth for months, and this is the one we've got. Uh, and I'm very proud of it because that's as damned close to it as I can remember. Originally, when I was very little and I drew it, I drew the wings much bigger because as a small boy, that's the thing that you know, takes all your eyes. But realistically, that's more like the wings. Mission patches, I always show these because people again say, where's the proof? These are the mission patches that um, the American Special Forces have. And this is peace through light and is a laser beam firing at a rocket. Well, the general public would be absolutely astounded to know that there are energy weapons. We'll call it a laser beam anyway. But that's not why I'm showing you. I'm, I'm showing it because there's a snake. Of all the animals or the images they could show you, they've used a snake. And on the left-hand side, um, we have a gray and a, uh, a B2 stealth bomber. The symbol in the, the center is a technical symbol, meaning the closest you can get to being radar invisible. And it's the 509 squadron. And the 509 squadron was the squadron that airlifted all the bits and pieces from Roswell out. So they have an official badge with an alien gray for the same squadron in 1947 that airlifted all the refuse and the dead bodies out. And yet, of course, people say there's no proof. In Latin, it says, tastes like chicken. And I don't know whether it means that the aliens taste like chicken or the humans taste like chicken. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, they even put a knife and a fork either side of it. Okay, this one is a, a, a dragon coming out of the clouds, firing uh, lightning bolts. And Latin translated says, get out unless you're initiated. Do you remember I talked to you about how I was initiated into the reptilians and I showed you the two pictures? That's the word initiated, it's very interesting. Here's another one. Um, what we have here is uh, one, two, three, four, five stars, area 51. So they can't say area 51, but they'll show the five stars and, a, and another one. So that's always a sign within the forces of area 51. You have the earth, it's not so clear here, there's a snake here and a dragon. And in Latin, incredibly, incredibly ominous, says, all your underground bases belong to us. That's what it says. All your underground bases belong to us. I don't see a human on there at all, actually. Here's one. Never before, never again. That's the translation. And we've got one, two, three, four, five stars on the left-hand side. Uh, more ominously, we've got three snakes guarding the earth. I'm going to use the word guarding the earth. So it's snake after snake after snake on black ops projects. We'll come back to this one. Knights Templar, this is the um, NRO, National Reconnaissance Office. That's the secret department in America that uses all the spy satellites. And they have a Knights Templar uh, defense, defenders of the domain. It's very interesting because greys, when debriefed uh, in Area 51, refer to the land as the domain. But unfortunately, that's not an alien, necessarily. We'll come back to that. The grid is very interesting. Has anybody researched the alien hat man? The alien hat man. Okay. This is a guy who um, worked for the NSA, National Security Agency, and his job was to pass exotic material to contractors in the private sector to do with what they wanted. He obviously worked for Boeing and a huge number of organizations. He's very, very anti-alien. And he has come up, this is not a joke, this man is not a fool, he is your business. He's come up with a, a velostatic hat which he's made himself. He doesn't 
ask any money for it. The people who are being abducted and want an end to abductions, he makes this hat, which they then wear. There are children in Britain who have special dispensation from their schools who wear his hats. And they have to be worn 24-7. And we'll talk about how they work. But this man phoned me at home from America and said, I hear you're a driving instructor. I said, yep. He said, do you know about the woman driving instructor in Britain who's giving driving lessons to alien hybrids? I genuinely didn't know about that. Now I don't know about that. And he said, well, what's happening is 2 o'clock in the morning, they're waking this woman up, she goes out, she gives these hybrids a driving lesson and comes back because, as I'm sure you'll know, they are trying to integrate hybrids into the human society. Um, well, I didn't know about that. And that was all news to me. Um, we had several conversations, I think it's about five or six hours difference between us, and then I made the mistake of saying to him, you're still in the military, aren't you? And at which point he never phoned me back again. So I got to assume the guy is still active in the National Security Agency, but that's fine. And here he is, his name is Michael Meakin, and you can find him on the internet, and if you genuinely have abductions by greys, then he might help you. Only greys. We'll talk about why that is. There's the man making the alien hat. There's a guy who wears the hat. And there's a, a girl who goes to school. And she's over 18 now. That's where I can use a picture. And she has a, a, a normal cloth cap over her special hat. Uh, I want to talk about it because it was very interesting. He phoned me up and said, oh, you're driving instructor and you know about this woman. About three months after that, I had a, a friend of mine saying, oh, there's somebody looking for some driving lessons. Would you be interested? Yeah, of course. It's a business. Of course I'm interested. Um, got this person's address, lived in a village about seven miles out of Whitby. Uh, arrived, the woman's actually outside, fine, and she gets. And as soon as this woman gets in, I'm looking at her and thinking, well, you're not human. Absolutely not human, because you think of your archetypal uh, hybrid head. And I, I'm very pedantic. I'm talking about human alien hybrid, because I've seen non-human hybrids. Don't just think that humans are hybridized. So we're talking about a, a human with what we'd call gray DNA, genetic material mixed in. So hair falling out, give you good, very white hair. She's only about 40, but very sparse, falling out. Um, eyes, very almond shaped, um, very high cheekbones and the back of the head, a bit like you get the pharaohs. Quite, she gets in, chatting away. Okay, um, let's see what you can do, drive. And we've been driving about 15 minutes and she just turns to me and says, do you know Dr. Stephen Greer? To which I say, well, no, I don't, but I know of him. So she wants this conversation about oil and uh, free energy, um, this, that, and the other, and I'm trying to teach her to get out of second gear because she's making my gear my clutch go. <laughs> um, so she wasn't a particularly brilliant driver, but she wasn't too bad. Uh, but the point I'm making is this bit as a classic example of what, where the difficulty to interact these people. I'm going to call them people because they are people. She says to me, can you drop me at the co-op? I'll do some shopping. Fine. Okay. Got her to park up nicely. This is the point that a pupil would normally pay me. Uh, back then, uh, I only charged £15 an hour because I'm not greedy. I actually just want to make a living. £15 an hour is really good. Didn't pay me. Okay, right, fine. She gets out. You can do that in a black cab in London and, you know, to go berserk. So I got out, chatted to her. £15. You know, you all know what £15 is, don't you? It's a £10 note and a £5 note. Or a £20 note and you want some change. And she holds me a £5 note out. Smiling. A really big smile. Now, I understand these people, so I just said, thank you very much indeed. I took the £5 note. Because they have no concept of money. And you think, well, how do you get around? We get around because you have a debit card. It's one of the very few times you actually had to use money, although they will have had lessons. Um, anyway, I, I thought, give it two weeks, and I didn't hear from her again, so I drove to the house and couldn't see anybody. The curtains were pulled. Um, went back again about a fortnight later, nobody went back a third time. I thought, well, I'll knock on the neighbor's door. I knocked on the neighbor's door and said, um, oh, I'm trying to get her in, you know, is she in? And the guy looks at me and sees our uh, housing association properties and he says, well, no one's lived there. It's empty, there's no one there. And I said, but she's got two boys. 
looked at me as if I'm mad. So I phoned up a Yorkshire Coast Homes, which is the housing provider, and they said to me, it's been vacant for six months. Don't know what you're talking about. So I don't understand why I only had one lesson. Why did I only have one driving lesson with her? She needed more. <laughs> so it, there's got to be a link between Mr. Hatman phoning me from America, N NSA, saying to me, oh, you're a driving instructor. Have you heard about the woman who does the driving lessons for the hybrids? No. Uh, and I know now what happened. I made a joke to him. I said, oh, I wouldn't have to do it at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd do it during the daytime. And then a few weeks later, I get the real thing. Um, but no concept of money. It's the grid we're looking at. And on the back of that one, you can see, not as clear, but there's a grid. Um, I'm not a New Ageist. Some of the stuff from the New Ages, actually, I'm quite good about and I think makes sense, but a lot of it isn't, and sometimes my story isn't one that a lot of people want to hear. That grid is not the natural grid of the Earth. That's not the ley lines. That is an energetic overlay. Uh, when you die, i.e. your physical body ceases to exist, your soul doesn't go back to source. It wants to, gets caught in that grid. It is struck with a huge amount of electromagnetic energy, which makes you forget. And then your soul, for want of a better word, I use the word soul, is put back into another body. And only sometimes when the process fails do you have what we call memories of past lives. Time and time and time again, souls are recycled on this planet. That's why that guy there stands there with the sword, because that's their domain. You're not getting out. That's a prison. This is a prison planet. I'm sorry, it's not a nice thing to say, but that's my view, and that's what's going on. And that's why on the Black Ops badge, it's exactly the same. It has a grid around it. Um, I was with somebody and uh, I was taken, we were both taken, physically taken while driving a motor car. I couldn't tell you how they did that. They have no clue. The person concerned also was aware and when the Channel 4 did the documentary of me, um, they thought, oh, Right, well, he won't be able to prove this, will he? So they said, uh, ha ha, you know, what's, what's the name of the person? Here you go, name and address. She doesn't live in this country, she's in another country, but there's the details. They absolutely went white. They never followed it up. There was another person who would have corroborated my story, but did they want it? No, they didn't. And this was uh, a take from the motor car, classic missing time. And the interesting thing was that we remember leaving a supermarket in a place called Scarborough, which you may know, and then Literally, the next thing we remember was a big lorry coming towards us, flashing its headlights. And I remember turning to my friend and saying, oh, there must be an accident up ahead. He's flashing to warn me. Or he thinks I'm on full beam. So I'll just flash him back to show him that I'm not on full beam and that it's okay. There was no accident. Uh, long story, won't, won't go into it, but that was actually a taken from a motor car. Um, and the technology that must be available to them uh, it's just staggering, even for me, how that was done. On uh, New Horizons website, you quite, quite legitimately lifted this picture. Um, interestingly enough, this picture was sent to me because I had posted this picture on the right in, uh, in one of my talks. And a researcher from America suddenly realized that, hey, we've got people in America drawing things similar. So he showed me that. Um, and it's nice when people thousands of miles away can corroborate your story or say, do you know what, I've seen something like that. And so that's very interesting. So I thought that would be good. Uh, that is meant to be a hole in the top, just as that has a hole in the top as well. But it was never drawn, I never drew that to show you, it was just for my own personal records. Um, and people say to me, go over it with a black liner so it shows out better. No, because that would corrupt the drawing. That's what I remember. Okay, very quickly now. Um, if someone could give me a 15-minute shout when we're running out of time, because otherwise I'm... Uh, when you're somebody like me, um, you tend to have a different relationship with authority. When I applied to be a driving instructor, I was told, we've got no records of you. We don't know where you went to school. We don't know where you lived. We've got nothing of you at all.
can you please show us, prove to us that you've actually been in Britain for a long time? And I did this to my grandfather, and I was able to show them. That's why I'm a qualified driving instructor. But it's very interesting that when the, the DSA, the Driving Standards Agency Authority, went to check, they couldn't, there was no records of me having any education in this country at all. And when this physical body dies, I will be completely scrubbed from the record. That's what they do to people like me. Right, I'm going to give you five examples. Because if I give you one example, you'll say, yeah, but that could happen to anyone. Two examples, so I'm going to give you five. Right, Hackney, London, oh God, 1994, 95. Uh, at home, my wife, six o'clock, having a cup of tea, tea again. Um, big bang outside, rushes outside. My car's parked outside the house, a BMW, the Americans call it T-boning, crashed straight into it. I rushed out, the guy jumped in the car and drove off. That's not unusual in Hackney. Uh, I got the, what we call the index, what people would call the number plate. Phoned the police, 999, uh, explained what happened. Right. Phone goes. Oh, hello, sir. Is that Mr. Parks? Yep. Oh, New Scotland Yard here, sir. And we've put roadblocks on every road out of London. And we've got him. We're bringing him back to the house. Will he be in? Take us about 20 minutes. Yeah, I'll be in. The policemen I always see are about seven foot tall. I have no idea why. I'm not joking with you. Six foot eight, six foot nine, six foot ten. Two huge policemen who don't, don't fit in, in the bloody roof of the house, almost. Bring the guy in. Uh, is this him? Yes, that's him. Right. He doesn't have a driving license. What's happened is he's stopped the car, gone in to get some fags. Because he can't drive, he hasn't put the handbrake on. The car's rolled down, smashed into your car. But the father has lent him the car keys, full well knowing he doesn't drive. Are you going to be in tonight, sir? Yeah. Don't go to bed early. Stay up late. Why? Well, just stay up late, sir. Okay, fine. 20 past midnight, two policemen, one the same, one different, walks up with the dad. And he says, well, they, they took me to the cash point. They made me take out 200 quid at one minute to midnight. 200 quid afterwards, that's 400 quid to pay for the damage. So he gives me 400 pounds and the policeman arrests him and says, right, we're arresting you now. So that's car damage in London. I pay my taxes, and that's the sort of service I would expect everybody to get. We'll get some more now. Knife man, Hackney, outside, three o'clock in the morning. Man with a knife that big trying to get into the house. It's Hackney, it happens all the time. Phone the police, 999. Man out there with a knife, right. He wanders off, and police car pulls up, copper runs right out, bangs on the door, are you all right, are you all right? Yeah, he said, I'm really sorry. It's taken us four minutes to get to you. We like to get to you in two to three minutes. Where did he go? Where he went, right, off he goes. And literally, I just watched the police go out of the left-hand window, wax on the brake. There's a woman and a man, coppers, run out. Oh, they spotted him. And it, it seemed weird because as soon as that, there was a police helicopter, sirens from everywhere. Telephone goes, is that Mr. Parks? Scotland Yard, he's sir. I beg your pardon, New Scotland Yard, he's sir. Um, we've got him. Um, we'd like to describe him, and they described him, combat jacket, army, wearing army clothes, because he was a soldier. Is that him? Yeah, I said, that sounds like him. Right, unfortunately, he doesn't have a knife on him, so we can't arrest him. What we're going to do is put him in the van, drive him five miles up the road, and put him out, out of the back of the van. You'll never know, you called us. Okay. Census job, uh, 92, 91, I did a bit of extra money, I did the census. And in London, that's a pretty rough job to do. And there was one housing estate where they were very unhappy. So I thought, I'm not having that, because if I don't get the census done, you know, I was young then. Um, sold the census now, but um, I, I, I wanted to do it. And I thought, that's not fair, because, you know, I want to call on these people's houses. So I went to the police station, Ladywell Police Station in Lewisham, and I said, uh, you know, I'm trying to do the census, and uh, these people are being very unhelpful. So the sergeant sort of said, what are you wasting my time for? You know, we've got better things to do than that. What's your name? Took my name, took my details. It's always the same case. They go and check. I don't know what it's from, national insurance number or what have you. Came straight out, said, hang on a minute, sir. Five constables and him, the sergeant, get in the van, we'll do it now. So five constables and the sergeant and me and, and my girlfriend at the time who was doing it in the van, drove around to the housing estate and they all, coppers, all came round to the door. Do you know what? We've never had 100% ever before from that block. That's not normal, is it? 
but at the time it was great, flowers, okay? Um, I devote a lot of my free time to, I don't like the word, it's the real word though, to deprogramming people who have been traumatized by Illuminati dark magicians who have fractured personalities and I don't charge. All they have to do is either get themselves to me, uh, if they can't afford to fly to me from all over the world, and I'll Skype. It takes a much longer time to do it by Skype. Uh, this were a mother and a daughter who came to me from Canada because she had, the daughter had a gin put into her. Um, and they had literally just been in my front room for about 20 minutes and the doorbell goes. Okay, the door. There's a boy about 14 years of age and again a policeman about 6 foot 10 behind him. And the boy is standing there with about three wilty flowers in his hands. So I look at the boy and I look at the policeman. And the policeman says, this boy's got something to tell you, sir. So I said, yes. And the boy said, I took these flowers from your garden. And the policeman said, I was on patrol. I saw the boy take the flowers. I spun the car around. I've grabbed him and I've brought him up to you. So I said, it's a very naughty thing to do. Do you want to keep the flowers? Yes, please. You can keep the flowers. And I tell you what, there's a couple of nice ones there. Why don't you pick them and take them as well? And the policeman wasn't going. So I said, would you like to come in? Yes, please. Came in, and the two people who come from Canada, both standing there, the, the, the sergeant comes in, looks at them, and says to me, well, I'll be on my way now. And the two people says to me, do you know what? And he just couldn't wait to see us, could he? Salesman, um, guy going from door to door, trying to sell scrap metal. Uh, I didn't like the look of him. Not because I don't like people sell scrap metal, but he had a, he had a whiff of the CIA about him. Uh, and so I did phone 999, because it's not an emergency, is it? You wouldn't want to waste public money. So I phoned the non-emergency number. Four to five minutes later, sergeant and a constable at the door. Are you all right, sir? Yes, I'm fine. It's just this man. We'll have details of him. Attempted breaking about seven, eight years ago in Whitby. Um, smashed the window at the front, phoned the police. Shock horror, they were five minutes to get to me. And the very first thing the, the, the copper said to me was, I don't want you to think we've only just arrived. We've had three cars sent, and the only reason I've come to your door now is because we just tell you we can't find them. So he said, uh, have a look through the bits of glass. If you can find any blood, give us a shout, because there might be DNA. He said, I can't look for it, because I don't want to put my DNA on it. Off he went, I thought, oh, no, it's not going to happen, is it? Look through, sure enough, piece of blood. <laughs> Oh, great. Let's see how good they are. Phone the police. Now, I'm not joking to you. I said, uh, I'm Lynn Whitby. I've just had a, a window, a front door broken, and the woman says, is that Mr. Parks? I said, yes. And I said, uh, I've been told to look for blood. Found some. Someone will be there in 20 minutes. And they were. Doorbell goes, and this guy, different guy, just puts a test tube and a tweezers, put it in there. Three years later, doorbell goes. Just wanted to let you know we finally caught the person that broke in. They weren't attempting to break in to get to you. It was just what we call criminal damage. These are not... When I talk to people and I explain what's happened, people say, well, I don't get that level of service. What I was told was that the government, the American government, has two lists. A list of everybody who has alien experiences and contacts. The aliens are supposed to provide this list, and it's not up to date. The government, therefore, creates its own list. There is another list where the human government has abdicated responsibility for those individuals. Sure, if I park on a double yellow line, I'll get a ticket. I have to pay taxes, unfortunately. But in terms of anything greater than that, it is not their decision. It was my human mother who told me that, and I understand that I'm on that second list. Right, uh, you may remember I did the, the radar visit. Uh, this completely confounded mainstream media because I'd gone public saying, look, my mother worked for MI5, my grandfather worked for MI6, and I see aliens. And yet I get invited into one of the most top secret locations in Britain. And the media immediately couldn't understand that because if this man's off his head, why is he being allowed into an American, it's not British, an American facility that is a space radar base? Why is he getting a personal tour? This doesn't make sense. And so suddenly the media didn't know what to do with me. Channel 4 did a, a one-hour interview 
regarding my um, family working with the Secret Services, and we did a half an hour interview with the backdrop of the radar station. Channel 4 told me they got a phone call from the Ministry of Defence telling them to pull it, or they wouldn't be allowed to do any of it. So they pulled it. Um, once I did the uh, radar base, suddenly all the BBC radio stations didn't want to interview me anymore. And I got a in big increase in foreign TV and foreign radio stations wanting to interview me. Here's a picture that you don't see. They don't like to show you that. That's the radar base and that's the razor wire uh, around the base. Um, it is a space radar and it goes up to about, allegedly, about 12,000 miles. Uh, that's what they call the fence, the fence. And it's the radar section, anything coming into that is detected. That's the official coverage. And that's Filingdales. I live 10 miles from Filingdales. Odd that. Um, the story I tell is uh, my daughter was also invited. I haven't got permission to talk about her, but we were both invited. And uh, at the, the barrier where the Ministry of Defence Police are, uh, you have to show identification. You have to show who you are before you go onto their land. So she passed her passport across, and the guy, obviously they are not semi-automatic machine guns, they're fully, fully automatic machine guns now, so they're very well equipped. And he looks at the, the passport, and he looks at her, and looks at the passport, looks at her, looks at the passport, looks at her, yeah, he's convinced that that is who it is, passes it back. I go to show him my identity, he just holds his hands up, says, that won't be necessary, sir. Go through. Um, at the briefing, um, I'm very fortunate to have got these pictures. These are exactly the pictures that were shown at the briefing. On the left-hand side is a missile, and the guy running it says, we track those, those are missiles. We track those, those are spy satellites. Ha 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 ha, it's exactly what he did. We don't see these. Ha 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 ha, we sometimes see these. Now, everyone else in the military who I've talked to have had this visit, so they never got that. But what is interesting is that is what's called the sports model, which uh, was found allegedly in Area 51. So the person who's produced this is, is, having, is having in his own way. He could have chosen any drawing of a UFO. But he's gone for what Bob Lazar, who allegedly, and I believe him, back-engineered craft on Area 51 called the sports model. So I got a special couple of slides for my presentation. I was invited on the 50 years that it had been operated. For 50 years there's been a radar base. And I'm not in the picture, that's not me, but... This was the official celebrations, um, and the, the real crew that matter are well at the back, so you can't see their faces, but these are the military personnel who guard it. Uh, that's not an ordinary police car. Ministry Defence Police cars are exactly the same, but they have a different logo. That is the phased array, which is the only one in the world of its kind. There is no other radar station like that in the world. It's three faces. It looks around almost the whole of the globe. And when it had the 50 celebrations, the Red Arrows came and, and flew over to celebrate. And it used to be an analog display, the three golf balls. And then it changed when the Americans went for Star Wars and became the phased array, which is digital. So that's where I got the tour. I had the tour of that. We'll talk about that very quickly. But it's 50 years. I want to show you how things have changed. These are Ministry of Defence police officers guarding a sensitive building some... 25 years ago. That's what they look like. Here they are now. That's what they look like now. Like that. That's how your world has changed. Unbelievable. A very interesting weapon. Very interesting weapon. That was it a number of years ago. Yes, this is the control room which we went into. In those days, look, there's even a fish tank. <laughs> right? But I tell you what is interesting. I'm going to move now. Sorry. It says here something along how many objects in space and there's something like 4,000 being tracked. 4,000 being tracked and this is 30 years ago. You can see the equipment. Let's have a look at it now. It's very hard to get pictures of this base. Look how it's changed. And people will say, well, where's all the big computers? It's a separate room. The computer room is a separate room. Now, you will find this hard to believe but one of my neighbours actually works there I don't want to give too much away, but he actually works on the computer room. And he's a neighbour. And we, we often chat about it. 
This is a staged picture for the, for the press, but it's genuine actions. When a contact, a UFO is contacted, the guy who's in charge is there. He's asking, I've got one contact. I can get it as well because I've made contact and I'm on the phone, the hotline, and they have also got it. I am coordinating these two and I can confirm we have a contact. Okay, that's, what, that's how they work here. What you don't see in any of these pictures is the secret part. I'm going to tell you where it is. Here is where the Americans are. This is a locked door. And when they have a UFO sighting, the Americans press a code which opens the door. These guys then take the orders from the Americans. So it is, a, it is called RAF filing dales, but it is run by the Americans. Okay, and during my visit, uh, we were there for, we should have been there for an hour. We were there for three hours. Um, and at the end of the visit, the guy running it said, uh, okay, well, we've got some things to give out. And he opened a tin and there was the uh, pencils and the rubbers and the um, uh, little trinkets. Great if you're running a scout club because you've got those things to fundraise or give away. I wasn't really interested in that, you know, pen fobs and that. But in the back of this, this case were all the trophies that they'd won. They have different sports teams. And in the side were medals celebrating this very special occasion of 50 years. And I said, oh, they're nice, aren't they? And he said, yes, they are nice. He said, I can't give one to you. Um, he said, um, because we have to we present them. We've only got 500. It's a limited number of 500. And we give them to people, generals and dignitaries who come to visit us and we've got to make them last the whole year. Can't give them to you. He said, anyway, we don't give them away. They have to make a, a, a contribution. So I said, oh, uh, what sort of contribution? He said, well, well, he said, they cost us 25 pounds to make, but we take a tenner and it sort of goes back to it. But, I, you know, they're, they're very special. And I said to him, well, oh, I was standing with two people. One was a, an ex-soldier and one was an ex-RAF. Um, and I said to him, well, couldn't you present one to me? And these two guffawed, laughed. And the guy said, I don't see why not. So I haven't got any money because I had to give everything out of the guard. But my daughter, who's much more bright than I am, had hidden some money down a sock. So I said, got any money? He got a tenner. So he gave me 10 pounds, gave him the 10. And he said, uh, the Americans insist I take your name. I said, you know my name. He said, yes, I know, but for official them. Gave him my name. He said, right, well, everyone has a number on this medal. And I have to write your name next to the, the medal number. You cannot sell this. You can only pass it down to your members of the family. I brought it tonight to show you if you're interested. Um, and the funny thing was that the other two guys both took out their 10-pound notes for one and he just locked everything up, put it away in the case and said, well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we need to go. Sergeant, if you take the front, I'll take the rear. And these two guys with their 10 pound notes. Uh, anyway, I've brought it for you tonight. It's, it's really lovely. It's got the radar base on the back and it says 50 years of vigilance. And there's the phased array. And on that side, it says number 86 out of 500. And uh, so I was presented it. So this is what the media and others can't understand. How is it that someone who claims that his parents were in the security service sees aliens can have a, a tour of a, a base and be treated like that? And this is what's made those people who want to make a fool out of me suddenly back off. And why, unfortunately, for many ways, the foreign press is, is all over me now. It's such a shame. Um, this is not my picture. It's sent to me. Orbs. I often get asked, what are the orbs? I don't mean the orbs that make the crop circles. I'm talking about these orbs. And twice now during Skype sessions, uh, a person has sort of got, oh my God, what's that behind you? And of course, I invariably look the wrong way. Um, and orbs are the consciousness of another entity entering your third dimension, I beg your pardon, our third dimension, simply because we're more dense. And when you project pure consciousness into a denser form, it will make it into a circle. So somebody is popping in and observing. It's not like a jinn or anything like that. That's somebody of a higher being zooming in, using his or her consciousness to come and visit you. So if you have orbs, 
somebody is taking an interest in you. Okay? And that's a genuine picture. It's not a lens flare. That is an orb. And you can see them because they are manifest in a 3D world. Sometimes people won't see things, but the camera will. And that's because it's phasing in and out between third and fourth dimension. Genuine, you've all seen it, but I don't want to tell you that is a genuine craft. I'm not saying that's an alien craft. Um, if we expect a false flag alien invasion, these are the craft that will be used. These are first generation back engineered craft. They're grey, small grey, not tall grey. Um, and these, if they're going to try and do a false flag, these are the craft they'll use. Okay, so just be aware of that. This is sent to me, it's on the internet now. I, pu I published it and everyone's got it now on the internet. This is a picture sent to me of an alien coming down an ordinary um, stairway from an aircraft having a high ranking meeting with somebody in the States. And it's taken on a very, very long photo lens, especially adapted for nighttime. It's been enhanced. And it's available now, you just get it on the internet, because why, why do we keep things secret? On the left-hand side, um, a artist's rendition of a lion being. I don't want you to think of a lion in a zoo. That's the name they're given, because their ears are about half an inch higher up than ours. Very human. Longer face. Look like a bit like a red Indian sometimes. Um, and this is a, a drawing from a book. And on the right-hand side is my drawing of what I've seen. And uh, the being makes a sign, which is an Illuminati sign, but it's the sign of the Great Pyramid. And these beings had a very important hand in the building of the Great Pyramid. Um, we haven't got time to talk about the races, but perhaps next time I might. Our talk is drawing to a close. Um, I can't say goodbye without talking about the birthday card and the interview. Uh, you may have seen the interview. I, I was on uh, the morning uh, breakfast TV show last year with Philip Schofield and Holly Willoughby. Um, for small groups who are starting up, I don't charge. I only charge my fuel. For a bigger group like yours, I do charge something. But for the private sector, I make them pay. If they want me, uh, then they pay for it because they can afford to. It's the people's money. Let's get it back. Um, but for small groups, any group under sort of 30, I don't charge. I go all over the country and I don't charge them. I only say pay my petrol because it shouldn't be about making money, really. Uh, anyway, these people really wanted me and they paid me £500 for 20 minutes. That's how much they wanted me. And I thought it was a good chance because uh, this is one of the largest viewed television programmes in England and it would be a great chance to get my story out without somebody you know, trying to make it difficult. Uh, I, I arrived at the studio and I was asked to do some drawings of the aliens. They wanted to put them up. I had two drawings, of course, mum and dad. The woman who was, was with me said they hadn't a clue what they were. I told her, took them away, came back and said, we are not allowed to show the reptilian drawing, but we can show the other one. That should be a very interesting point for you. The interview itself was excellent in the sense that Philip Schofield is an incredibly intelligent man. He understood about souls, he understood about Eastern religions, a very, very uh, intelligent man. Uh, Holly Willoughby was perfectly fine. The interview was uh, very interesting because I attacked a senior conservative politician who had attacked me earlier. And when I got back home, I had a, a phone call from the Labour Party saying, next time you're going to um, attack a senior Tory politician, for God's sake, tell us, so we can have the press boys ready. <laughs> and that's me being interviewed, Schofield, Holly Willoughby, and the drawing of Mum. But they wouldn't put up a reptile, because that's just too near the truth, in terms of power and influence. And now I'm told that um, I'm not going to be interviewed anymore by radio stations because I keep getting the better of them. Although Philip Schofield asked me to go back. About three weeks after that, he insisted that I go back for another interview and I just couldn't do it because I was working in a school um, and my constituents come first. And so I said, no, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I have a prior engagement. But Philip Schofield was very interested. 
but I don't really get many interviews now in Britain because I don't come across the way they want. They want a raving madman. It doesn't work like that. So they can't handle it, so they don't want it. You're all familiar, hopefully, with the birthday card. I have brought it along for anyone who hasn't seen it. Uh, this is the birthday card that has my picture on it, although I have no memory of being on it. And whoever was sitting next to me has been airbrushed out and a big teddy bear put in there. Who in their right mind would buy a birthday card that said Sir Geoffrey was about to discover that bears don't just in the woods? And the story is that I was in a shop called Card Factory and my wife was buying discounted wrapping paper in January, as you do, and I turned and on the carousel was these pictures. Uh, you know the story because you've checked it out on the internet and I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, but what I have done tonight, and not only have I brought the card, but I've brought my ID badge when I was a Labour councillor in London at the same time because I have the same shirt on. Because people say to me, how oh, do you know that's you? And I say, well, of course it's me, but prove it. Well, I have a picture here with the same shirt on. And when I was meeting a, a, a Tory government minister, and I always meet these people, I have the same shirt on. I don't have the same tie, unfortunately. So I brought that along to show you. Uh, what's that about? The camera is not through the window. That's a hidden camera in the footwell looking up. And this has been placed here by the security services uh, to say, uh, either we know what you're up to, I wish they'd tell me, because I don't, or um, you did a good job. I haven't a clue. Okay? So uh, there were only five or six of these cards made, literally. And the only store that they were distributed in was the store where I live. So there was only five or six of them and they only went to the store. And the managing director of um, the card factory who managed the store where they were in said to me, well, we pull them now anyway. And I said to him, why is that? Because I made a complaint. And he said, no, no, he said that they were a test run. And I said, well, you know, how many have you done? Thinking they'd done thousands. Uh, and he said, well, we did, I think it's five or six. I said, you only made five or six. How do you know whether it's going to sell well if you've only done five or six? His answer was, I'm only the managing director. <laughs> That's honestly his reply. And I said, you're telling me you only made five or six, and which store did you put them in? Your store. So I think that says a lot. Uh, I went to the press because I thought, I want pressure on the company. The company who hold the copyright are in America. What a surprise. I contacted them, and they said to me that uh, the name for this person in the card is not the same name as me. So I said to them, you're telling me that's not me then? And the response was very telling. Oh, no, Mr. Parks, we're not saying that's not you, but the name we've got for this person is not yours. To which I said, what are you going to do about it? And the reply was, nothing, because English law doesn't touch us. So because of that, I went to the newspapers. I wanted the media to phone the company, which they did. And the, direct, uh, the editor of the Whitby Gazette then, John Stokoe was his name, phoned me at home and said, we've researched you, uh, Simon, and I'm convinced your story is genuine. Uh, I've been to the other side, and they are just saying no comment. Do you want me to make this national? because he said, I can, we can make a big story out of this. And I said, no, because this is security service stuff. And he said, you might be right. Um, and I just thought I'd end with a tall grey, because we don't really hear about tall greys very much. There's a tall grey, very nice creature, very happy. Some tall greys are horrible. This particular one was very nice. Um, I ended up being upset because it just wanted to observe me. Uh, I felt like a, an animal in a zoo. Uh, it didn't want to come and show me anything or discuss anything with me. He, he, it's what the Americans call um, coupon day. He had got the coupon to come and see me and have a, have a chat with me. So that's it. That's the end of it. So thank you very much indeed. If you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. I'm happy, if it's a personal nature, to exchange emails. Um, but if there's any general questions now, I'd be really delighted to take them. Hi. A lot of what's been coming up recently, I've been looking at, is the um, star Sirius and Orion's belt. What, what has that got to do with all this and the and everything? No. If you were fortunate enough to actually go 
not so much to the pyramid, but to some of the temples that contain the real burials of the pharaohs, you will find around that time, allegedly, uh, lots of figures which Egyptologists claim to be men with masks on. Uh, from Sirius A, uh, you will find beings that are portrayed with cat faces. Uh, very, very prevalent with the building of the uh, pyramids. Um, what we would call the Lion people, for want of a better word, originated from Orion, one of the Orion planets. Orion's very important, as is Sirius, because there's a very big star portal, stargate there. Uh, the race divided, and one group went to one of the Sirius planets, and we, we would refer to those as the Cat people. But they have a name, and their proper name is Kilroti. Kilroti. The Kilroti, the ones that worked with the priesthood uh, to organize and build the pyramids. I personally don't accept the pyramids are only 5,000 years old. Okay? Uh, as, as a geologist, uh, I would say you're looking at between 15 and 20,000 years. So I hope that's of some help to you. I, I haven't gone into huge detail about it because um, we haven't got the time. If you've seen the Channel 4 documentary, then you know all about the cat people, and I'm quite happy at a later date to talk about it, but we're on questions. But thank you. Anybody else? Hi. Do you have any comments to make on animal mutilations? Um, there were two, two, two very uh, prevalent guys who uh, investigated them, both in Wales uh, and in other parts of the country. Um, and they have some very interesting pictures of cattle actually being lifted up. The only device that would you could take an eye out or take a tongue out would be with a laser beam. Uh, some of the greys have what, we, what you'd call Harry Potter style a wand, which is a self-defense weapon. In fact, from the Roswell crash, they, they collected, that's where your laser beams come from. Um, and it is a laser that's used to cut them out. They are using or taking parts. Some parts, glands, can be interchangeable with, with humans. However, the black ops, the military, are also taking cattle to throw interest off and to create a, a smokescreen. Um, it's a contentious issue, and a number of researchers who have gone down that road have found that they attract an awful lot of attention. Okay, okay. Anybody else? Gentleman at the back. Hey. Um, if I was, and I'm not, if I was a member of the Illuminati, I would be very worried at the way things were going because it would looking more and more unlikely that my new world order was going to come to fruition. And so I would need something bigger than 9-11 to allow me to have martial law. And the best way to do that would be to have a enemy force from outside which would mean that every country in the world would feel they would have to come under the banner of the Americans for protection. Uh, that would allow me then to um, do a number of things with you guys. I could get you to be chipped so that uh, I would know exactly where you were and I could control you. It would allow me to say, oops, there's a, a, an epidemic of alien virus. I need to inject you all. But the reason that it's a real conundrum is because once those dice are thrown, there's no going back on it. There was a, a big debate about the Olympics. Would there or wouldn't there be a false flag uh, invasion? And the trouble is, you know, when researchers quite genuinely put this point forward, it's like crying wolf. And people begin to say, look, this is ridiculous. You know, you say there's an invasion, there isn't. This is going to happen, there isn't. All I would say to you is, that if you make enough noise and bring it to the attention, they can't do it because too many people have woken up to it. And the hope is they keep on doing this and then the voices of dissent get less and less and less until something happens and some people get wind of it, but not enough. It doesn't do the rounds on the internet. Um, it would serve the Illuminati very well. Any more questions? Uh, just gentlemen first, then you. Right, okay. Um, I ideally hope that humanity can evolve 
I dearly hope that humans um, can do what you need to do, I beg your pardon, do what we need to do simply because there is no 7th Cavalry coming to your rescue. You are the 7th Cavalry. You have to make it happen. There is no one going to come and help you. And it's very, very important that you resist anything that is going to take away your sovereignty. My own view is that humanity is going through a very crucial energetic phase at the moment. We talked about very briefly Jimmy Savile. Ten years ago, that would never have come out. Think of how things are coming out now. And what it is is that officials in medium to medium high positions can no longer live with themselves, with the guilt, and they are whistleblowing and they're coming forward. Now, we haven't got the truth of Jimmy Savile, and that's my Illuminate talk. But at least it's coming out. A year, a year ago, less than six months ago, um, the police dug up a dead girl body in Scotland that had been there for nearly 40 years. So for 40 years, somebody knew that this girl had been murdered and buried there, and now it came to light. And this is happening right across. Do you know, if you, if you well, you may do, the crime figures for this country are the lowest they've ever been since records began. And in nearly every other country in the world, the crime figures are the lowest. Humanity is changing. The problem is that, that your bog standard, ordinary, decent, lovely human wants to see a volcano erupt. They want stars and bright colors because they are physical people in a physical world. If I can't see it and I can't touch it, it's not real. That's not the change that's coming. The change has got to come from within. The next change isn't the smaller transistor or the faster computer. The next change must be your ability to be telepathic, your ability to lift something. Can you imagine how awful it is for me at home? I have